All right, so this is by far the most interesting CS lecture, I would say, because we actually start um, seeing how some of this stuff plays out in the real world. Uh, like a lot of what we've been talking about the last few days has been like, theoretically, this is how this works. And theoretically, you know, like designing your algorithms to follow a structure where it's using uh, like O of one or O of N is going to be better than like using a quadratic uh, function in, in its place. And that is absolutely true. Uh, and what you're going to see today is kind of a actual reflection of why this stuff is important and how it impacts uh, not only your users, uh, but also the business interest itself. So we are going to get started with our fun little CS in the morning today with hash tables in the wild. And I'm going to start just by briefly explaining hashes as they uh, were explained to you in the lecture material from uh, overnight, the GA, the my GA stuff. So uh, hashes are going to uh, take an input and produce an output. And that output is always going to be the same for a given input. Uh, so for example, with the GA module last night, that module took in names and it assigned each letter of that name a value based on its position in the alphabet. It added those values together and then uh, took a modulo of that to actually go and create a hash. So uh, this is kind of what that did. So this is like a really, really simple hash function that we're running here. We're taking in a name and we're assigning a value to a letter based on that, uh, based on its position in the alphabet. So like, say for example, R is in the 18th or position in the alphabet. So we're assigning the number 18 to R. U is the 21st letter of the alphabet. So we're assigning the value 21 to the letter U. Same thing with B, it's the second position in the alphabet, Y is the 25th position. We're adding each one of those values together. So we're adding R, U, B, Y represented as numbers. When we're adding those together, that's getting us 66. And the example last night, we were essentially like placing each one of these people into one of uh, 12 houses that we had available to us, right? So we took the modulo 11 of whatever number that the, uh, that the owner, uh, the owner's name produced. So whenever we take 66 modulo 11, that equals zero. So in this case, Ruby would have been placed in house zero. So any questions on this before we move on? Just kind of a real base idea of kind of like what you saw last night in my GA module, but. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit behind. Why 11? Uh, so like the example last night was placing uh, people in one of 12 houses. So uh, essentially the modulo 11 would place someone in either, or I think it was actually 11 houses. So this modulo 11 would place someone in one of uh, 11 houses that were available to put someone in. So that modulo was just saying, I have 11 positions that I can put someone. I'm going to uh, put someone in one of those 11 positions. It's the uh, available space, essentially, cool. that we were given. Yep. All right. So, uh, essentially for the rest of today, we're going to be talking about an in the wild implementation of, uh, hash tables. And specifically, we're going to be, uh, talking about, uh, the, have I been pwned, pwned passwords data set, which is created by Troy Hunt. So this was launched in 2017 and it's a collection of passwords that have been exposed in data breaches that have occurred since 2013. There's uh, over, at this point, 600 million 
uh, unique SHA-1 hashes as in this data, uh, data set. And each one of these hashes corresponds to unique password. And the hashes can be accessed using an API. Uh, we will get into SHA-1 hashes here in a little bit. Uh, but for now, just know that that is a hashing algorithm, just like our example earlier was a hashing algorithm, just like this. SHA-1 is just a way for us to take an input and create a output. And that output is always going to be the same depending on the uh, depending on the input. So, uh, we've used APIs before and we've always had a reason for using them. So why would someone use this particular API? Uh, so first reason, uh, the password generations might want to use this API to avoid providing known compromised passwords or to alert users when an existing password that they have has already been compromised. So this is something that's actually implemented in a lot of uh, password managers out there. Uh, but for example, in one password, they do implement this idea of uh, essentially, you know, letting you query this database with all of your passwords and see, hey, do I have a password that has been exposed in a data breach? Uh, second reason, uh, beyond a uh, service, a like password generator service wanting to do something like this, a website itself could also uh, implement this idea so that it doesn't let users create insecure passwords to begin with. Uh, so in, in the wild example of this would be like EVE Online, uh, which is a uh, popular MMO game. So essentially with this, we're saying, uh, hey, whenever a user has a insecure password that they're using on an account, we want to let that user know so that they know that the account has, is potentially able to be compromised. Uh, also, this would potentially allow you to prevent users from signing up with a compromised password to begin with. Uh, another reason you might want to use this API is if you need to comply with uh, NIST password guide guidelines. So uh, NIST is a government organization, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, and they are uh, they're essentially a kind of governing body over uh, technology over like uh, the U.S. government as a whole, um, and part of what they uh, require is part of their uh, password guidelines is that you must make sure that passwords are uh, not used that were obtained in previous uh, breaches. Wait, so I know that in the previous slide, it said that... Um that like this Eve website couldn't see your password. Can have yep. and Pwn see the password or no? No, and we will see why here in a little bit. There's a really, really like fascinating implementation that they do to actually like have some level of security around the user password. So uh, that's actually literally what we're going to talk about next. You guys are really, really good at like hitting my next point, like right before I do. So good job. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to be doing with uh, using this API is getting the user supplied password. And then we're going to hash that password with a SHA-1 algorithm. The implementation that we use today to be able to accomplish this is going to use JS hashes. And that resulting hash that gets created is a hexadecimal value. That is how SHA-1 works and most hashing algorithms really. So after we have that user supplied password that we've hashed, we're going to make a Git request to uh, this API endpoint. And what we're going to do 
is append the first five characters of the hash to that request. So let's see what a uh, SHA-1 pass, uh, hash actually looks like. Uh, so what we're going to do now is share this other screen. And I'll load this up. So this is a hash generator that is uh, using uh, SHA-1. And what we're going to throw in here is a password. And my password is going to be password. Actually, I'm going to use password with an at. So fancy. All right, so uh, actually, yes, this is what I want. Cool. So I have a password here. And you can see that down here, this password as we typed it in generated this SHA-1 hash that lives down here. As I type up here, you can see that this hash changes. This is just a calculation that's happening as I'm typing it in. You can see though, whenever I type in this password like this, this is always going to be my output after it's run through this SHA-1 algorithm. So what we have here is our hash. And this is always going to be the same whenever I have the same input. So if I type in password, my hash is always going to be this. If I like refresh this page and now I type in password, it's going to still be this. Whenever I have this input of password with this at symbol and a capital P, this is always going to be the output. So and that's because it's at B secure necessarily, because if you figure out the algorithm, can't you just like go backwards? Uh, so the so idea behind yeah, the idea behind this hashing is that you can't take this hash and generate this password without doing a bunch of work. It is possible, but it would take a ton and ton and ton of time. And the idea is that it's not going to be worth an attacker's time to try to reverse this into this. But there are also potential, um, like, overlaps where if you happen to have the same if you have a different password that maps to the same hash I forget the exact name of the attack but basically that's a that's collision secure. collision it could be yes. uh, secure. yeah yeah so just as a like so, uh, something that I would like this is kind of a brief off track for a second but since we're talking about uh these hashes and how they're generated. Uh, SHA-1 is kind of part of this overall MD4 uh, hash that was uh, essentially created in uh, the 80s or, or, or so. Um, and then MD4 was replaced, or M yeah, uh, MD4 was replaced by MD5 in 91 or so. Um, and that was essentially like there's been a bunch of iterations of this, uh, these hashing algorithms where collisions were discovered to occur. Uh, whenever you have possible collisions that can be made, a uh, hash algorithm is then kind of declared to be insecure. Uh, so for example, this uh, SHA-1 hash that we are using for this, um, essentially back in the early 2000s, I think around 2003, 2004, uh, this SHA-1 um, hashing algorithm was discovered to have potential collisions, uh, which weren't necessarily proven, but that is kind of what uh, intelligent agencies were uh, able to uh, 
decipher out of this. But in 2017, I believe, this was actually like uh, able to be discovered widely. Uh, and there was proof that like, hey, this is actually going on. We actually have real collisions in the SHA-1 algorithm. Uh, and now we actually typically would see something like SHA-3 be used for something that we need actually super, super secure that's still part of this MD4 family. So just real brief overview history behind these different uh, hash generators. Again, not like wildly important that you like know that kind of stuff just know that like hey these hash algorithms if they have collisions they're kind of going to be insecure just by their nature all right so uh this again just to like really hone this idea in whenever i have this input this is always going to be my output whenever i run it through the sha1 algorithm so if you were trying to I guess kind of like reverse engineer this would the only way to do that be to take that hash you have right there and then just start like plugging in passwords and seeing which which password generates the same hash code basically yeah so pretty much basically like you could only the only way you could do it was by like brute forcing it and guessing yeah that would be um the typical way of going about doing this yes all right so um, that is our SHA-1, let's, um, stop my screen share over here, re-screen share down here. All right, so, no, what in the world, that's not even what I'm watching, cool. All right, so. Uh, in that example that you just saw, uh, I showed you a uh, password and we took that password and we generated the SHA-1 hash with it. And this was our hash. So with this hash, what we're going to do is take it and we're actually going to grab the first five characters off of the start of this hash so in this case that's going to be 9e7c9 so that's the first five characters as they exist up here so these five characters are used in our api call down here And this is how we have kind of a certain level of security around how we're talking with this pawn passwords database. So this, uh, our API call here is only sending these five characters. We're not sending a full hash of the user password. We're only sending the first five characters and it's going to return to us a list that has all of the matches after these first five characters. So any hash, any full hash that starts with these five. Again, we'll touch on this more in a second, whenever we actually make this postman call. What's, which the, is the, magnitude, thing to do. what's the magnitude of the data that we're gonna get back for uh, something that long? Absolutely. So what we're going to get back, and you'll we'll see this in postman, so this uh, essentially allows us to uh, get back, there's a, around about a million, uh, a million tables that we are able to get back with this API call by breaking it down into, by sending these five uh, hex digits that we have. So what we'll see here is that whenever we get uh, whenever we send out this API call, what we're going to get back is around 500 ish results for each one of the possible hashes that we could send, uh, because they have around 600 million ish, 
uh, unique passwords that exist as part of this database. So whenever we're breaking that up into a million different, uh, or around a million different uh, tables that we're able to ask for, then what we get back is going to be around 550 to 600 for each one. So we can kind of see that here. Um, so again, this is the API call that I'm making to uh, the Pond Passwords database. And it is, uh, again, you can see here that we're sending this 9E7C9. So if you'll remember, this is kind of what we generated earlier. This is this password and this is the hash. And what we're doing is grabbing the first five characters of this hash and sending it to the uh, API. We're making the IP, a, I, uh, API call with that. So you can see here that what we get back are the remaining digits after uh, this first five characters. So this zero is the sixth character. This one is the seventh, nine is the eighth, so on and so forth until the very end. So everything in this document here that we get back, the full hash is this value up here, this five characters plus the rest of these characters down here, the rest of these hexadecimal digits. And then you'll see after that, there's a colon that we have right here. There's a colon after every single one of these entries. It's a touch bigger for us, actually. Perfect. So there's a colon after every single one of these entries here. And then after this colon is going to be a number. This number indicates how many breaches have been associated with this full password. or rather the hash of this password. So let's go ahead and look for the actual value that we wanted out of this. So here we have, we know that we're looking for 9E7C978. So we're going to search in this. This, you'll notice in here that this is ordered. This is an ordered list that we get back from them. So we can come in here and we can look for something that starts with seven. I'm gonna go ahead and take these side by side just so we can see this. So I'm looking for something that starts with 7801. And we can see that right here, 7801. I bet it's this one. And we can see that this password that we've put in here and that's been turned into this hash has been in 7,491 breaches. There's been 7,491 instances of this password being used in no data breaches. Any questions about how this API works, the data that we're getting back, the data we're sending, how any of this is working as we're like reading through it, anything like that. So it looks like you're not sending the first five because in this hash, it's starting from the second index or the third third character, right? Um. So I think you mutated. Yeah, there we go. I definitely oh, mutated oh. it. We're good. Okay. <laughs> I just got very confused there. Sorry. Like, so you yeah, yeah. Two, and then you go five and then you keep going. Okay. So sorry, I, I missed a little bit right there. So just to reiterate, cool. it's starting from after the parameters that we gave it to search. Yes, that's correct. So we sent nine E seven C nine right? And that is the first five characters of this hash, right? So everything that we're getting back here is the remainder of this hash. 
And could we send more than five characters to it? Like, could we just no? Send that full this is down? this is how the API works uh, because they want to ensure that there's a certain level of security and that we're not sending them actual full hashes. So that's like the security component on their end is like we're we don't know what you're actually asking for. Um, we're sending you back one of these like we're sending back 500 passwords here, um, and also you could have any literally anything after this as well. They're only sending back passwords that are part of known data breaches. So if you have a password that's unknown in here, so like say we just type a bunch of random gibberish um, and we ask for 267E1, whenever I come in here and I look for CDEF, I'm going to guess that it's not going to be there. So C D E O oh, C D E F eight. Nope. C D E. How did that happen? Generate. Okay, cool. Uh, C D E F one E A. That's what I'm looking for. C D. Wow. I just saw this. C D E F. So this starts with eight two. No, that's CFEF. Yeah. Cool. Nope, we're good. So you can see here that this, the remaining hash here, doesn't appear in this list because this password has never been compromised before. Cool. Any questions about this? Any more questions? All right. So let me reshare the presentation. So seriously? No, go away. Why would I play you? All right, so just to dive more into why the first five uh, characters of this hash. So we've already talked about like the security aspect of this. Uh, this is essentially going to ensure that like, hey, we have a certain level of secrecy about the actual user password uh, that is being tested here. But the other benefit of this is that it allows us to look for the desired uh, data really, really quickly. Whenever we send this hex, what we're essentially sending to uh, this API is an index of the data that we want to get back from it. So that makes the data that we're looking for really, really easy to find. And it actually becomes an O of one process. And it also isn't uh, like because we uh, have kind of divided this problem up a lot, uh, instead of having to send us back 600 million entries out of this database, uh, what we're sent back is only a millionth of those possible values that are in this database. Uh, because again, our, uh, our potential hex range is going to range from this 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 to F, 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 F. And that's going to be about a range of a million. So instead of, um, instead of sending this whole password, which would create trust issues, uh, we're able to instead just send a little chunk of that password. And that helps both us and it helps our, uh, it helps our user because it protects them and it helps uh, the Have I Been Pawned database because they're able to come in and say, hey, this 9E7C9, whenever we translate that into a decimal value, 
but that's going to be is 6,490,161. So we look in our password database. This is like just assuming this is an array, which it's not, but this is kind of what this process would look like is I want the uh, 6,649,161 value out of this password database versus going through and doing like a for loop over every single document that exists in this database. I'm saying, give me this document rather than like, I need to search through this entire database until I have a match. So are we saying that the first five letters, the first five uh, characters are never repeated? Theoretically? The first five characters would never be repeated, yes, because each one of these is going to correspond to a unique document that would send back around 500 to 600 entries out of this uh, whole database. Oh, so we are getting multiple entries back though from... Right, we're getting multiple entries back, but we're able, they're able to pull up that document as it exists in their database already and send us back that document directly. Got it. So you're saying that the document, this is the single key to multiple values. Right, exactly. Yeah. So again, just like kind of finding this out in an array, this is going to be an O of one process, whereas this is an O of n process. Doing this like for each loop through every single entry until we find uh, something. If this wasn't in a uh, data structure like a hash table. So let's talk about the data that we get back a little bit more. Uh, We get back these plain text hash suffixes. So you'll remember back when we were looking at our Postman data, this wasn't structured in like a JSON-like format. What we were getting back is actually text. So this will be kind of like your first, uh, probably the first thing you've seen where we're getting back text data instead of uh, instead of getting back something like JSON data. So it's going to be on us to be able to turn that data into something usable. So we get back those suffixes, and then what we're going to do, uh, whatever we're going through this data, is reappend the first five characters to each one of these suffixes that we have. And after we do that, we're then going to look at the count for each one of these uh, items. So once we have all this data, what we're going to want to do is actually map it into a bunch of objects, an array of objects that we've got. So this is kind of what we're going to massage this data into. Remember, we're getting back just these uh, plain text suffixes We're appending the beginning back to it, and we're grabbing the count off of the end. And that's going to turn our data into something that looks like this. So, let's see a demo. Uh, So, what we have here This is kind of like just a little structure that we built. Whenever we type in a password here, what we should get back whenever we submit this form is a message that says this password has appeared in data breaches. And then this is going to be the number of times that it's appeared in a data data breach. And we're just going to say to our user, you probably shouldn't use this password because it's appeared in a data breach. If I type in something random that's hasn't appeared in a data breach before, I'm going to get back this message that this password has not appeared in a data breach. So let's look at the actual code for this. So uh, this is just a really, really simple 
like unit one JavaScript uh, file that we've got going on. So we've got some HTML, we have some CSS, and then in this other file, we've got some JavaScript just to like quickly talk about this HTML. Uh, we have a uh, message to the user to provide a password. We have a form here for a user to actually submit a password. And then we have a message. And the meat of this uh, is all going to happen inside of our main.js that we've got here. So let's talk about this code. Uh, we're going to tackle this one by one. Up here, this is all unit one stuff that we did. We are doing a document.query selector and we're doing a, we're grabbing our form, we're grabbing our password input, and we're grabbing the message that we eventually are going to want to display. And I'm adding an event listener to our form so that whenever we submit, we uh, check the password. Let's talk about checking the password next. So, uh, checking the password, we are first going to prevent this form from redirecting us to a different location, because that is how forms work. If we just submit something, it's going to redirect us just automatically. Uh, so we want to prevent that action. And I want to get the password from the password input dot value. So back in our HTML, that is this input right here, where the user has actually entered their password, this is where the user is typing in stuff. So this is the password. And then we've got a bit of a like kind of a uh, curveball here with this new hashes. So where is this coming from? Uh, so this is essentially going to generate our SHA-1 hash for us. And then we're turning it into uppercase. We're using the password to create this uh, SHA-1 hash. This is coming from a uh, library that we've loaded in over here in hashes.js. And there is a whole lot to this file. We are absolutely not going to dive into this at all. But this is the library JS hashes. This will allow us to generate a lot of different uh, hashing algorithms, like MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, uh, SHA-512, all, like all of these different hashes are available within JS hashes. So this that we get back after we call on JS hashes to give us a hash of the user password, this is going to be our hashed password. Again, we interact with this API by getting the first five characters of the hash. And we use those first five characters of the hash to call upon a retrieve have I been pawned uh, results function. So I send the first five characters of the hash to this function. Let's look at that function next. So in here, this is, remember, our first five characters. And I'm doing a fetch to our base URL. Uh, so remember, this is the API uh, up here, api.pondpasswords.com slash range slash. And then we're appending the first five characters of the hash after this. So for our example that we've been using uh, so far, uh, if I remember correctly, let's just double check. This is going to be catch will call on API. Passwords on slash range slash. And then the first five characters of this hash were E-A-N-W-R-D. 9E7C9. So that is this right here. 
And then remember that we're getting text back from this API if we look back on our Postman. So we are getting text back. You can see that here. We're not getting like JSON data or anything like that. This is not valid JSON. We're just getting back text. Does that mean, <clears throat> sorry, does that mean that there's line breaks in there too? There are line breaks. There's line breaks between each one of these lines, and that's how we're actually going to break up our data. That, like, literally, you're all incredible because you hit on my next point every single time. We're going to split this text up that we get back by the new line. So every new line, we're creating an array. And that's what, or every new line, we're creating a element in array, I should say. So, uh, that is going to be results. This is going to be a simple, uh, this is going to be a simple string, an array of strings. So we map over those results and for each item in our results, what I'm going to grab is the hash and how many times it's occurred in the, uh, in breaches. What I'm doing here is returning an object out of this. So again, we know lots about map at this point. We're essentially going to be creating a new array for every single item. And that is what's going to be returned out of here. So what gets returned out of this whole function is an array of objects. Each one of those objects has a hash, which is the hash value of the password and the count, how many times that hashed password has appeared in a data breach. Once we have that, we come back up here. That is, uh, have I been pawned results? What we do with this is see, is this an array? That's what we expect to get out of this. If we don't have an array here, then something went wrong and we just render that result with an error. Say, oh no, something went wrong. If we do have an array here, we know that we got results back. And what I wanna do is a binary search, which we've talked about before. So we pass this on to a binary search function. This just lets us find, go through all of these 500 items and find the result a little bit faster. Rather than like doing a for each loop over it, uh, we're able to grab our result in a much quicker fashion. Again, since we're looking at like 500 things here, the most amount of searching that we're going to have to do through those results is about uh, nine to 10 searches. If we have over, um, if we have over 600 results that get returned back to us, we'll need 10 searches potentially to find what we're actually looking for. But instead of searching through 500 items, doing this binary search, again, allows us to be super efficient. And instead, since this uh, data is already ordered, whenever it's coming back to us, all we have to do is say, cool, if I, you know, am I taking this, uh, if the, the hash that I'm looking for, is it greater than or less than my midpoint of this uh, array of objects? And if it is, if it's greater than, in the case of what we're doing, this 9E7C9, it's always going to be greater than, so we're going to start at the right side of this. And we're just going to narrow in our on our result. So instead of searching through 500 items one by one, we search through all of our items using this binary search. A great application of the things that we've learned. So whenever we actually find our search result here, uh, again, this is going to either return negative one or the index of the midpoint. All right, so what we get back here is either negative one or the index of the midpoint. 
if we get back negative one, that means that we haven't found the hash that we were searching for in the results that we got back. If we get an index of an array, then that means that, hey, we have a match. This password has occurred in a breach before. So we pass that search result and all of the results back to this render result function. So render results is down here. All that we're doing in here is pretty much some DOM in our action. Uh, we're removing a class list up here and then we're adding one depending on uh, if we have an error, if everything's okay, or if we want to warn our user. So uh, if our match is equal to negative one, remember that means we haven't found a match in the data that we got back. That means that this password has not appeared in a data breach. If we didn't get an error and we uh, didn't have a match, that means that this else is going to fire off, which means that we had something, we had a match in this database or in the data that we got back. And we're going to say that the password has appeared in data breaches a certain number of times. Anyone have any questions about this code or interacting with this API, anything like that? Very good. So uh, that is our code. Reshare my other screen. Sorry if I missed this, David. I've just been following your screen. Do we have access yeah. to that? To the code? Yeah. Uh, yes, I will send out a GitHub link to that right after we're done here. Thank you. Yeah, totally. All right, so that was our demo. Hey, we prayed the right side this time. Great. So all this is fun, but why do you actually care? Like all, this has been a fun little journey, but like, what is the advantage of using these hash tables? Why do like why does any of this actually matter? Why is this a good implementation of anything that we've looked at today? And the answer, as it usually is, is money and also speed. So, just to give you some ideas behind how this data is being structured and served up to us, um, and how active this API is. So these are all uh, Cloudflare servers where this data is being served up around the world. Uh, this data is cached in each one of these servers and uh, is available globally. So we have super local servers to all of the users that would use this, more than likely. Uh, we're also, you can see up here, using a uh, we're serving a ton of uh, requests. We have 32 million a week. Uh, and again, this is back, I believe, in 2019, uh, whenever all this data was published. So, of course, this service has only grown more popular since then. Um, a lot of these requests are hitting the cache that exists on the servers out here. You can see that there's, for our 32 million hits, almost all of them are being hit on this cache. Uh, so they're being served up super quick, local to your users. Uh, otherwise, like we have 100,000-ish that are uncached requests that have to actually go to, uh, in this case, an Azure uh, database to actually look up the data here. I think it's a little ironic how many uh, Cloudflare servers there are in China for this, considering that the CCP can see your password when you type it in, so. Very true. <laughs> uh, we also have, you can see in here, 
uh, bandwidth getting used, like 500 gigabytes of bandwidth almost of just this te these text files that are being sent back and forth uh, across the internet. Like that, this is a ton of data that's getting used every single week. 500 gigabytes of text. That's tons and tons and tons and tons of requests, uh, tons of data that has to be served up. Most of this again is going to be cached. So that's a good benefit. And, but we're still serving up about a gigabyte of uncached data uh, bandwidth per week. So I know that a lot of like, you don't know system infrastructure stuff. You all don't know how much the stuff actually costs your new developers, but just like if anyone wants to spitball, like just how much do you think this would cost every month? That was literally gonna be my next question. <laughs> That's so much. Like even just think about compute, think about, um, you know, having all of this bandwidth that has to occur, all of that stuff. Just a, a What's it hosted amounts. on? Is it hosted on AWS? 50K. So a lot was, of this- I was gonna say 60. So a lot no, of this I'm is sure. coming through Cloudflare because a lot of it is cached, but uh, yeah, total, like um, the rest of this is coming through Azure. So anything that's uncached, anything that is using Azure uh, bandwidth is using Azure. Yeah, I guess 60 to 75K a month. Cool. $5. All right. $5. Um, Ian is the closest. <laughs> this data uh, is costing about 2.6 cents per day to support one, 141 million monthly queries of 517 million records. That's wild. What is this data again? Uh, so again, this is text data that's getting sent, right? Where we've already kind of seen like, hey, this is like the actual bandwidth that's getting used. These are the actual requests that are getting made, all of that. There is a little bit of hackiness to this, but we'll get to that in a second, where a lot of this is being hosted on Cloudflare for free because Cloudflare is a, like a sponsor of this project. But even if you took Cloudflare out of the equation of this entirely, and all of this was only happening on Microsoft Azure, which you're paying for compute, you're paying for bandwidth, you're paying for storage, all of that stuff. Uh, if we are on Azure, even then, all of this is only costing $10 a day to run on Azure. If you extra extrapolated all of this stuff out. I know that like, again, you're probably not like, you're looking at this kind of stuff over here and you're like, what are gigabyte seconds? And like that, you know, kind of put that out of your mind. We're not too worried about that, but know that because of essentially what we talked about way, way, way long ago, this kind of process up here, because of this, whenever we're looking up records in the database, we're not using, we're barely using any compute at all because the user is sending us exactly what we're looking for. We're not doing compute on this. We're not doing searching. We're not doing iteration. We're not doing any of that. The user's sending us exactly what they want. And we're able to do that because these passwords are hashed and we're looking in hash tables for all of these values. So we're not using a whole lot of compute. And also because like, even though we're serving up, you know, millions and millions of requests uh, every week, uh, those requests aren't using a ton of bandwidth because all we're doing is sending these hashes around, these text file hashes. There's nothing really to these. It's super, super cool. Also, because of all of this, we're not doing any iteration on any of the stuff. Uh, so we don't have to search through every single one of our records to find the data that we're looking for because we're getting the index directly from the user whenever they're sending it to uh, the service. You can see in here that we have super, super fast responses to users.
because we're not having to like iterate over all of this stuff and see, oh, like I'm looking for this specific piece of data in this big, huge chunk of data. I'm looking for this, give me this. So we're comparing being able to validate a password versus find the hash index. All right. right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by finding by ha by having the uh, user essentially send us that hash, send have I been upon that hash, what you're able to do is make that an O of one process, whenever you're doing your lookup, instead of having to do this iteration over this entire database, with over a million records inside of it. I'm wondering though, if you have a specific user and that user has an ID, couldn't you get a similar performance by just, you technically have a unique ID that you could just look up as well. And then their password is a field on their document or something like that. Um, not necessarily in this application because we don't have like actual like, have I been pwned doesn't know about actual users. All they know is cool. You're sending me this, like the first five digits of this hash. Let me oh, go and find that record and send it back. Yeah. 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 Got it. Got it. Yeah. So because of the performance of how these hash tables work, we're able to send back this data super quickly to the user. So just to wrap all of this up, hash tables are fantastic if you have the right use for them. So you can see in here, our hash tables allow an access of O of one. They allow us to search with an O of one. We can delete and insert through them with O of one time as well. Gobs of fun. Hash tables are great. This has been Hash Tables in the Wild. Any questions? Very good. So that is the last of our CS in the morning modules I have for you. Uh, you will continue with CS on Monday with Shazad. I'm going to stop recording.